This weekend is one of the best known weekends of the summer. In fact, it's kind of right up there with Christmas and Thanksgiving and even sometimes Easter, which is one of my favorites. But it's the time that we celebrate our independence and we remember those forefathers who went before us who gave so much of their lives to help keep us free. Think about that. They were friends, and they had to trust one another, and they had to bond together for this independence, that this struggle is still going on today in America and throughout this world as we see it. So today I'm going to tell you about four friends who went that extra mile to help their dear beloved friend who was a paralegic just so they could have Jesus heal him and what they had to do. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. This passage from Mark is one of my childhood passages. I had a Bible story book, and it was not the normal Bible story book. Y'all have heard me talk about my Aunt Lois. I mean, she is the one that I'm standing here. The reason why I have my firm faith at birth as a United Methodist. So she gave me this book, and it wasn't probably, as I said, the most ordinary Bible story book because it didn't have the children's pictures. It had portraits in it of all the different stories. My favorite one is this one because I can see. Now picture this. Picture this in your mind. A very crowded room. This man is being lured from the roof into this room and everyone is looking up including Jesus being Lord can you imagine the sight I couldn't he's being Lord and as you look at this slide I want to go one little step further and let you know a bit of the background that's going on in the gospel of Mark much of Mark's gospel is very down to earth. He does not fluff things. He doesn't add things as the other three gospels. It's the shortest gospel of out of the four. And it's one of my favorites because it is cut and dry. He cuts through the quick. It's a great read, and it's not a hard read. It's very easy to read the gospel of Mark. But Mark's gospel is constantly telling us of the good news from the prophecy at the beginning from the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament until Jesus' death on the cross. That is the book of our gospel of Mark. And he reinforces these teachings and traditions as his story unfolds. So in today's reading, there is a very significant passage besides the healing, and the love of the friends, it is in verse 10, as Jesus starts to proclaim his authority and his power. These people have gathered. They have heard of Jesus' healings throughout Galilee, and now he's made his way home about to Capernaum, and they want to see this man. They want to see this man who heals people. They want to hear his teachings. So many have gathered in this very small crowded room. And there's no more room to gather people there. I want to kind of relate this to going to Jazz Fest in New Orleans. So when you get to the big Acura stage where the big bands are going to play, and you look out, and there's no place, because you didn't get up as early as the rest of these folks to sit in the hot sun, you're kind of like, wow, what am I going to do? How am I going to get down there to a good seat? How am I going to see this band I've been waiting to see my whole life? 
this is what these people are trying to do. These friends are trying to do. They're trying their best to get their friend to see Jesus. So in Sunday school, remember that day when that, your teacher talked to you about how houses were built in Jesus' times. They were usually square houses with flat roofs. They were made of sticks and straw and mud. So, what the, these four friends, they look around and they think, hmm, what am I to do? They look up. Aha! It's an aha moment. Well, we're just going to go upstairs, because usually there was a set of stairs or maybe a ladder leading to that second story where they used that rooftop for perhaps cooking or uh, drying clothes, because there was very little yards in those days so that's where they did a lot of that and sometimes they would sleep up there so they make their way up to the roof and then you see and hear all what's going on above you can you imagine being in that crowded room and there's no place to move and little bits of mud start falling on you and then the hole gets bigger and bigger and bigger and I just kind of wonder in my mind what has happened to all these building materials is it coming down on them or are they kind of scooping it up who knows what's happening at the time but the main point is they start lowering their dear friend to Jesus and none of the people in this room understand really What's going on? Because they just was concerned about seeing Jesus, about seeing this big band as we see in Jazz Fest. They want to see this man who heals. They want to hear his teachings. They don't want to see this man coming down. Hey, you're, what are you doing to us? You're taking away our moment with Jesus. But they're okay. Because as Jesus sees the man, Lord, he witnesses the friend's devotion and trust and faith in him, not in any other, but in Jesus. He says this one phrase to the man. Son, your sins are forgiven. What a simple sentence. But it just proves to all of us what one's faith in Jesus can do for a friend. Could you, would you, should you do this for your friend? Think about that. Think about that on this weekend, this Independence Weekend, what brothers did for brothers and friends that did for friends. And what this four friends did for their loved one. But the scribes, those wonderful scribes, those doubting Thomases we see are there in that crowd. They are the religious experts. They study everyday scripture. But do they believe? Because they witness the same thing everyone else is seeing. But then in their minds, questions begin to form. Is this blasphemy? Who is this man, this Jesus, who, has, who thinks he has the authority? Who is he? Why can he heal this man? Has he healed this man? I hadn't seen the man get up yet. Jesus hears all of this, not because it's not spoken out loud, but through his spirit. You know, those times when as a mother, you look at your child and, you, and, you're, and he's, your child's doing something that they should not be doing and they look at you and you give them that look. <laughs> That's that time. Your spirit knows what they're doing and they hear you saying, no, no, no. Jesus quickly rebukes them. He looks at the man that's lying there and he said to get up. Take up your mat and leave. He is quickly rebukes them by establishing his authority and his power as the man takes up that mat and walks out 
of that crowded room. He is establishing himself as the Son of God. We're shown in the story the steadfast love of four friends whose faith never faltered. They knew Jesus would heal their friend in the most difficult situation. Who makes a hole in a ceiling for a friend? Think of that. It's the one who has faith in our Lord completely. We all have friends. And again, would you, could you, and should you do that for a friend? Of course you would, because our friends sometimes become our family. I read a daily devotional from Henry Nowen. I am a great follower of him. He is my rock when I need to hear something. And he centers me and he brings me back each morning as I awake. So one morning out of the devotional, part of it was, and I'm going to share this with you, when we honestly ask ourselves in our lives which persons mean the most to us, we often find it. It is those who, instead of giving much advice, solutions, or cures, have chosen to share our pain and touch our wounds with a gentle and tender hand. Friendship is one of the most essential parts of our lives. Where would we be without our friends? I'm an only child. My friends become my family quite often. And I look out to everyone, and y'all are my friends. And you become my family. And I thank you for that. But Jesus had his disciples as his friends and his family. Even when Jesus was dying on the cross, we remember these words he said to his mother Mary as she was standing beside John, the disciple whom he loved. Woman, here is your son. Then he said to John, here is your mother. This is trust and friendship because Jesus knew John would take care of his mother to her dying day. Could you be that friend? And as I said, this weekend is full of many celebrations. And we remember those forefathers that established our freedom. And we are thankful for that freedom because this would never happen without friendship. Don't take friendship for granted. I'm going to tell you of a little story that happened to Wayne and I when we were on vacation in Mexico last week. We got into the resort, and I was really, really tired. We'd had, I'd had a funeral to officiate on Saturday, and then I, I'd had another one to attend. It was a hard day for me that Saturday, so when we got to the resort that Sunday, I thought, oh, gosh, they're going to give us a sales pitch. We need to buy something. We need to go on a, a tour. I didn't want to do anything. I just wanted to sit. So our concierge came up, and he was talking to us, a very nice young gentleman named Manny. And instead of trying to sell something to us, he sat with us. And he got to know us, and we got to know Manny. And through this conversation, uh, he was asking us what our occupation. And Wayne said, oh, I work at the local Air Force base as a civilian employee. And then Wayne, my dear husband, <laughs> smiles because he's about to tell this young man something he probably never heard. And he looks at him and he kind of says, and she's a pastor. Well, he looks at me. <laughs> And he kind of tw turns his head, and he says, he was taken back for a moment. He says, I've never met a woman pastor before. <laughs> so at that moment, I started sharing about our church, about being Methodist. And then I started telling him about the history of our church, because he was very interested. And I showed him the picture of the dome, our beautiful dome. 
And he was so astounded by it. He, he says, this is the most amazing thing and beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. So we ended our conversation and we checked into our room. And when we saw Manny the next day, he says, I've got something to show you. He pulls up his phone. It's the picture of the dome. He went to our church website and found that picture. And then he says to me, but I don't understand.